is 1230, so we're going to go ahead and start. Welcome, everybody. My name is Sharon Reed, and I'm the Programs and Events Coordinator for the Hood Museum of Art, Dartmouth College. And I want to welcome you all today to our virtual inaugural John Cobau Collection Lecture, The Great Collector, with Kevin Brownlow, filmmaker and film historian. This is uh, about a one hour program and there will be time for Q&A near the end, which will be led by John R. Stomberg, Virginia Rice Kelsey, 1961 S Director of the Museum. Please don't wait until the end of the program. Don't feel you have to wait. The Q&A field at the bottom of your screen, you can answer your questions anytime. I know it's easy to forget once you've gotten uh, deeper into a presentation. If you have a question at any time, pop it in there. We'll be keeping an eye on that. The program is being recorded today and it will be uploaded to the museum's YouTube channel within the next week or so, so you can find it there. Um, I will be loading a few housekeeping tips in Zoom for uh, in the uh, into chat. Um, and we will be alternating images today, just to let you know, we'll be going between Kevin uh, and some of the images, so you'll see us going back and forth. And now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Michael Hartman. Jonathan Little Cohen, Associate Curator of American Art. Michael. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I'm thrilled to welcome all of you to the Hood Museum of Arts inaugural John Cobau Lecture, which is the first in a series of annual lectures generously supported by the John Cobau Foundation. Today's talk is presented in conjunction with the Hood Museum's current exhibition, Photographs from Hollywood's Golden Era from the John Cabal Foundation Collection which celebrates our recent acquisition of more than 6,000 vintage Hollywood photographs from the foundation. This exhibition was curated by Kathy Hart, our Barbara C. and Harvey P. Hood 1918 Curator Emerita of Academic Programming. I believe Kathy is on this call. Hello, Kathy. Uh, and was generously supported by the Hanson Family Fund. It will be on view until May 21st, so I encourage all of you to go and see it if you haven't already. Today, though, I am delighted to introduce our inaugural speaker in this series, Kevin Brownlow, who is an Academy, Awarding, Academy Award winning filmmaker and film historian. Brownlow fell in love with silent films at age 11 and joined the film industry in 1955. Since then, among a very long list of accomplishments, he has co-directed two feature films uh, and has also restored several silent films, including the five hour long Napoleon, which was presented with a score composed by Carl Davis, and Rex Ingram's Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse from 1921, which was Rudolf Valentino's first great success. Brownlow is also an accomplished author, having published The Parades Gone By and David Lean, and he is currently working on a biography of director and producer Sidney Franklin. Today, he will speak with us about his specialty, the silent film era, while telling us more about how John Cobal formed his collection of Hollywood photographs and expanded it to become one of the finest in private hands. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Is that the signal to go? Yes, it's all yours. I met John Cobal in London in 1963. He was a young Canadian of Austrian origin who collected stills with astounding success, judging by the examples he showed me. He was very tall and striking looking, had dark eyes with a slight disconcerting squint. He was capable of real intelligence, but you didn't always realize this because he loved the trivia of Hollywood, the glamour, the press agentry. He talked nonstop, could sometimes be very funny, but the pressure for one's attention could be demanding. John was turned on to the subject thanks to a massively illustrated book from 1957 by Richard Griffith and Arthur Mayer called The Movies. I still recall what an eye-opener that book was for me when it first appeared, he wrote. Movie history, about which I knew nothing, took on an energy and dynamism to equal that of the contemporary films in which I was immersed. The stills drew my attention to the extraordinary visual quality of silent films and to lighting techniques, which created effects as rich and subtle as that of the great painters. Much later in 1988, the catalogues of American feature films from 1911 
to 1930 came out, compiled by the American Film Institute, and we both acknowledge them as the most useful series of volumes, for us anyway, so far published. Nearly 40 years later, I find myself continuing to use them almost every day, and they enable me to identify such lost films as Rex Ingram's Chalice of Sorrow of 1916. John raved about Ingram, the stills he had found from his pictures showing him to be one of the most, of the, of the pic, great pictorialists, along with Maurice Tourneur. Tourneur's assistant turned out to be the brilliant Clarence Brown, the favorite American director of Greta Garbo. They made seven pictures together and John made sure he had stills from every one. Garbo, written with Raymond Dugnat, illustrated from the Cabal collection with stills like this, became one of his first books. By the time John had organized his countless boxes of stills, he formed himself into a photo library. And when magazines and TV programmers saw the range and quality of his material, he became the library of first choice. There were very few similar collections in private hands. Of course, collectors amassed old stills and lobby cards, but no one was as tenacious, as knowledgeable, or as gifted with such astonishing luck as John Cabal. He was an unusual character. He gave dinner parties at his apartment in Kensington, which while spacious, was not designed for film projection. However, there was a building across the street, helpfully painted white, and this became his screen, to the surprise and sometimes alarm of residents and passers-by. One neighbor looking out the window was overheard to say, God, I didn't know I was that drunk. After all these years, emblazoned on my memory, is the moment in 1963 when he paid his first visit to my cutting rooms on the top floor of a Victorian building in Soho. I was startled first by the sound of a dog's claws on our 69 stone steps, and then by the appearance of Sam, his very large Weimarana, a canine explosion, in fact. The dog had no problem with the presence of visiting producers. He was delighted to meet anybody, as was John. And this particular day, John was carrying something which proved to be a genuine Pandora's box, full of original 10 by 8 stills of stunning quality from Gloria Swanson films of the 1920s. He knew I was working on a book devoted to the silent era and must have been gratified by my reaction. I could disguise neither my astonishment nor my enthusiasm. Now you have to understand that in this period, silent films were of little interest. People working in the industry regarded them as too primitive to be shown to modern audiences. The public's attitude to silent films was based on what was served up to them. Who could argue they regarded them as jerky, flickery, absurdly acted, and technically hopeless. The aim had been, when talkies arrived, to kill interest in silence altogether. Very early, extremely primitive films were shown, speeded up with camp commentaries and honky-tonk music to make audiences think, those were the movies we loved so much? The screening of a silent drama in a good print at the right speed with orchestral accompaniment was an unheard of event in those days. I remember a Garbo retrospective in London at which they showed Susan Lennox, Her Fall and Rise, the only film in which she starred with Clark Gable. So not a silent, but a rare early talkie made in 1931 and photographed by the great William Daniels who shot almost all her silence. He was using the same stock, the same lenses for this early talkie. To my amazement, the cinema was showing 
an original nitrate print, but it was out of focus. I asked an usher to contact the projectionist. Oh, this is an old film, he said. There's nothing we can do with it. By some osmosis, the focus was adjusted and the picture suddenly sprang to life, the crispest, most beautiful image you could hope to see on a screen. But this same contempt made it simple for studios to deal with the old silent negatives clogging up their vaults. They shipped them to incineration plants and received small amounts of money for the recovered silver. One company, Fox, used another method. They loaded the cans aboard barges, which were towed out to the deep water off San Pedro, whereupon they were pushed overboard. John Cabal was at the beginning of his epic search when I knew him. The most important thing he needed was confirmation that what he was doing was worthwhile. What he was doing was risky. As a BBC correspondent, his technique was to go to a film company, flash a letter from the BBC and ask to see their stills library. The BBC connection gave him access to the distributors, some of which had been in existence since the birth of the feature film. He was very persuasive. And when he chatted to the girls in those offices, they often took him down to the basement where he was confronted by acres of dark green filing cabinets, many of them stuffed to the gills with stills from the silent era. He didn't always need to go to these basements. In Wardour Street, the heart of the film business, you could patrol the streets at this period and see dumpsters overflowing with stills, publicity jet brochures, window cards from the start of the feature film up to the Second World War. John obligingly removed the best of this material, but he was short of a place to keep it. He brought many of them to show me, and when he saw my reaction, he went back for more, returning in some cases with box loads. He left them with me. I was only too eager to exchange some of my more routine stills for those for which John had doubles or in which he expressed little interest. You have to understand the difference between an original, which had been taken on a plate negative and which was of superb quality, and a dupe, which was generally of indifferent quality. John's were invariably originals. He and I visited a stationery shop across the street, bought a filing cabinet, and we lugged it up my 69 steps. All four drawers were soon full. John, to tell the truth, was at this stage more interested in the sound era and in particular the musical. He was working on a book about them. So I looked after the silent stuff. It was at first joint ownership. I was determined to hang on to them for a book I would one day write on the American silent film. John certainly brought that event closer. And when the book, the, the parade's gone by, reached the publisher, the standard of illustration obliged them to produce it to the highest standards. I realize now we were technically receivers of stolen goods, <laughs> but we knew that the companies would do with the stills what they'd done with the films. And sure enough, they did. John recalled a studio he visited where he witnessed original negatives being destroyed with scissors. John was desperate to meet the stars, especially Marlena Dietrich. I could not conjure up such an exalted figure. The first silent star I managed to bring together with him was a minor figure called Dagmar Godowski. She never reached the heights but she was eager to be recognized by youthful film historians, which made our lives a lot easier. She was the daughter of a world famous pianist, Leopold Godowski, and the sister of the co-inventor of Kodachrome, the finest color stock available for amateur cinematographers. To be honest, she didn't have that much to tell us, but she had worked with Valentino and was quite witty. When at a party, she was asked an indiscreet question. How many husbands have you had, Miss Godowski? 
She replied, two of my own, darling, and several of my friends. John managed in his description of her in his marvelous interview book, People Will Talk, to be equally indiscreet. Quote, more than anything else about Dagmar, more even than her ripe billowing fatness, the first thing you noticed were her eyes. But I have to admit that compared to most other works of film history, his ability to describe these divas was unparalleled. Another quote, Dagmar liked to give the appearance of being slow, of good-natured ambling, with much cheerful sighing and playful wheezing at the weight of age, but those eyes moved fast. She'd still be shaking hands in the doorway and enthusing about a concert the night before. All the time, those eyes sighed stuck the room, the people in it, and the best spot to sit, and never far from the food or the center of interest. She didn't have to take the center spot. It came to her. But if the guest of her honor was other than herself, she made an attempt. She made no attempt at upstaging, like one who has seen and known all the world's great and can afford to stand out of the light, which of course only made her more interesting and inevitably brought the star of the evening into her orbit. Dagmar was born in what is now Vilnius in Lithuania around 1897, so she would have been in her late 60s when we met her. She said that the scriptwriter June Mathis may have put Valentino on the map, but I introduced him. I liked Rudy, she said, and he was very, very poor. A very charming, very well-mannered, rather shy man, and I could never understand his appeal. Could you? <laughs> one of the most unusual things she told us about, uh, uh, go to one more. One of the most unusual things she told us about Chaplin was that he could find a particle of quality in the poorest picture. He enjoyed seeing films and he always expressed this enjoyment. He would spring to the defense of any film or any director who was being harshly criticized. He knew how difficult it was to make a picture. I used to love going to see his movies with him, she said. He used to laugh till he cried. Then he would nudge me and say, wait till you see what's going to happen now. And when it happened, he was convulsed. I think I enjoyed watching Charlie, watching Charlie more than the movie. Dagmar became a fixture in our lives whenever she stayed in London, but she wasn't Marlena and it wasn't long before John conjured up a meeting with Marlena herself. The great Dietrich used to claim The Blue Angel as her first film, that she had made no silent films at all, for they would suggest her age, wouldn't they? Yet she'd appeared in no less than 17. When John heard she was in London, doing a personal appearance for the film The Black Fox, a documentary on Hitler for which she'd spoken the narration, he managed to get both of us into the press reception. She looked absolutely fabulous and there was an unexpected warmth about her. I've just seen you in Shifte for Laura Mention, I told her, a silent film she'd made in 1929. Shh, she whispered, I'm not supposed to have made that. We attended a concert she gave with Burke Bacharach and John saw a lot more of her than I did but then he was able to speak German with her. Yet there was no Dietrich interview in his book. Dietrich was famous for refusing interviews. And she even turned down the Austrian actor, Maximilian Schell, her co-star in Judgment at Nuremberg. She did not want to be filmed. That was a stumbling block, which Schell overcame by interviewing her only on audio. No pictures of her as she was in 1982, aged 81, when the film Marlena was made. Shell's camera prowled around a reconstruction of her apartment as a background to her fascinating replies. However, she refused to answer several questions in a row, the indiscreet ones, which might explain why she refused John. I used to give shows of rare silence from my collection. 
I remember John was living on a houseboat when I went to a party he gave, bringing a new acquisition, a Clarence Brown film, Smoldering Fires, a superb drama of 1924 starring Pauline Frederick. There was nothing old fashioned about the film, apart from the title. And John was fascinated by my beautifully tinted print made from the negative, sharp and clear, and tinted to reflect the emotions as well as the story. Here is a laboratory catalogue, Pape, 1926, showing what tinting you could order. Night was blue, bright daylight was yellow or amber, artificial light was dark amber, special effects could be green. Tinting and toning gave an extra excitement to the visuals. John was remarkably sensitive to still photography, but at this stage it was apparent he didn't quite get silent films, nor how to appreciate them. He needed concentration. He picked it up soon enough, but I couldn't understand why with his passionate enthusiasm he hadn't caught on right away. Meanwhile, more and more stills poured into his filing cabinets, most identified by the distributor, some like Paramount, even provided title and star and elegant white lettering along the side of the still. Yet it was often difficult to find the correct title. Directors used to hate the stills man because as soon as they'd get a satisfactory take, the assistant director would yell, hold it for a still. The players would freeze and the stills man would trundle onto the set with his equipment and delay production for just as long as it took. As John discovered, they were seen as a nuisance to be tolerated. They were answerable to the publicity department, of course, and the front office, producing the vital images to appear in thousands of newspapers and magazines across the world, together with theater lobbies, even painted on posters, intended to lure the public inside. They had little difficulty. At the height of the movie craze in the 1920s, the New York police had to close the streets around the theater district at movie times because the crowds were so overwhelming. Program pictures might run for two or three days in neighborhood theaters, but on Times Square, for instance, at the Astor, King Vidor's War Epic, the big parade, ran for two years. Perhaps John's greatest achievement when he finally got to the USA was to track down the surviving stills photographers, revive their reputation through exhibitions, and in some cases, put them back to work, reuniting them with their original negatives to print from. Handsome art books resulted. Mac Julian, Fred Archer, Madison Lacey, these he wrote are a few of the names which we look for in vain in the mass of movie books almost every one of which uses, but never acknowledges, the work of these men, the early still photographers. The lack of regard accorded to stills photographers outside the industry was a result of their treatment within it, he continued. It was extremely rare for them to work with a director like DeMille, Frank Borzaghi, or Joseph von Sternberg, who did not merely tolerate but actually aided the still photographer at his job. By 1918, the taking of stills, previously done by motion picture cameramen on the set, had become a function in its own right, and the stills men took the same risks and hardships that were part and parcel of the cameraman's lot on location. As he pointed out in many cases, the still photographer's work is our only record of films which have been lost through fire, flood, theft, or chemical decomposition, and others whose prints are so rare they must be locked away in archives until the money becomes available for copies to be made. One of the difficulties of writing any sort of history is the way those who survive tell their tales. Even so uncontroversial a subject as the making of a film, 
When I asked Lillian Gish about the work Erich von Stroheim had done as technical advisor on D.W. Griffith's Hearts of the World in 1918, she said he wasn't on it. I knew she disliked him <laughs> and would have preferred it had he not been on it, but we thought that her statement was a bit questionable to use in the documentary we were making. John had found a photograph showing the Griffith Company working on this war film among the pillars of Babylon, the set for intolerance, which was still standing at the time. Part of the photograph had been obscured with white paint. When it had been carefully removed, it revealed the proof we needed. Eric von Stroheim adjusting the KPE of an extra wearing the uniform of a French soldier. John's qualities had to include chutzpah, or he wouldn't have gone as far as he did. He was determined to meet the stars, and one knew he would. He gave the, occasion, he gave the impression occasionally of being a screwball, but I never heard the term used because of what he managed to achieve. And if occasionally he had to tread on his friend's toes, so be it. After my first trip to New York, which was primarily to visit my American girlfriend, I told John how she, being an actress, was constantly disappearing for rehearsals. So I'd filled in the time by meeting veterans of the silent era. When I went to Hollywood on a subsequent trip, I took care to write to them in advance. And I was told by colleagues in my cutting room that John had spent time consulting my correspondence files and listing addresses. He even turned up at my girlfriend's New York apartment seeking free lodging. However, his BBC association was more suited to his interest in the sound era. When he returned from his BBC sponsored trip to America, he played me some of his interviews. They were very lively, very informative although I was startled to hear he interrupting Betty Davis, already well into the story of her career, to ask if she could make him dinner. And yes, of course, she did. Many of those interviews were included in his book, People Will Talk. I was amazed that he managed to get people I assumed were impossible, like Joan Crawford, who had had a substantial silent career, and Loretta Young, the book was welcomed with enormous enthusiasm by reviewers. The art critic for the Times wrote, sparkling, indiscreet, overwhelmingly informative, the book is the portrait of an age, a contribution to cultural history, and the best gossip you read in town. John described how each interview progressed or failed to progress, and the raves held good today. Simon Crocker told me that John used to invite the old stars to stay in his apartment. Quote, he had Veronica Lake and Gloria Graham at the same time, he said. He was awoken at two o'clock in the morning by the two of them arguing over which had had the bigger film career. <laughs> it turned out that while few of my discoveries made it into his book, one address that he did find useful and how was that of Louise Brooks. She'd experienced an unexpected comeback, not through her American films, but because of the revival of two German silence made by G.W. Pabst, Pandora's Box and Diary of a Lost Girl. I recall a prominent staff member at the British Film Institute raving about her, not just occasionally, but endlessly. I wondered if John, stunned by her exquisitely lit portraits, would be disappointed at meeting her in her neon lit kitchen. He had kept in touch by telephone when he was at the BBC in New York, but a face-to-face -face meeting would be delayed by, well, I won't spoil his vivid account in his book. <laughs> John and I, had a long talk about our working relationship and I tried to set it on an even keel. I wanted him to cut down the number of visits to the cutting room. Aside from the films I was supposed to be editing, 
I was trying to write my book on the silent era. It didn't do much good. He haunted the place, which obviously fascinated him. I had to yell at him occasionally so I could concentrate on the chapter about Buster Keaton or Mary Pickford. I remember a lunch with John at a West End restaurant when he held forth on von Sternberg with such volume and intensity that a woman got out of her seat, marched over and stared at him in silent fury. Life became difficult when he began inviting people to the cutting room. I was an, em an employee after all, and the owners of the company were likely to make unexpected visits. I told him I was beginning to feel like James Fox in The Servant, and he was very offended. The result was that to my dismay, he moved everything out of the filing cabinets. We continued to exchange stills, but the relationship <clears throat> became rather more distant. Simon Crocker had joined him in 1976 and quickly became indispensable. He was a veteran of the music business and ran the Cabal collection with a single secretary when John took a year off and lived in Germany. I loved him, he said. He could drive you mad, his mind darting all over the place, but you had to ride that. I loved his enthusiasm. He was the most interesting person to be around. He was very generous, always lending money and seldom getting it back. I really enjoyed working with him and I carried on for eight years after he died. I ran the Cabal collection and I'm still on the board. John admired the work of Cecil B. DeMille, whose flamboyance he shared. He spent a massive amount of time writing a book about his work. He conceived it as two books originally, and no doubt DeMille deserved it. I didn't really share his admiration. I found the DeMille films I'd seen, mostly talkies, I admit, on the ridiculous side. As Ogden Nash put it, Cecil B. DeMille, much against his will, was persuaded to leave Moses out of the Wars of the Roses. After the publication of Parades Gone By, I received a letter from Louise Brooks attacking my chapter on DeMille. And when I visited her in Roch Rochester, New York, she insisted I go and see James Card, curator of nearby Eastman House, and watch what DeMille was doing in the silent days. Card set up a series of screenings which convinced me that DeMille was among the great artists of the pioneering era. Of course, there was always the Ten Commandments to contend with, which despite its spectacle still had its absurdities, but watching tinted and toned original prints on the Eastman House screen confirmed John's high regard, and later to my surprise, I found myself making a documentary about Cecil B. As Robert Dance says in the introduction to his DeMille book, John was the first scholar to have unfettered access to DeMille's house at 2000 DeMille Drive, 2000 in French, of course, being De Mille, where his papers, collections, and memorabilia were left essentially in place as they were when the filmmaker died in 1959. John describes roaming from room to room, up in the attic and down in the basement, everywhere finding treasures. And he incorporates into his story many of the telegrams, letters, memos and files he found and which the DeMille estate allowed him to publish. John had worked on 30 books, staged a prestigious exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum about Hollywood photography and had turned his hobby into a flourishing business. The Credit Cabal collection became familiar alongside his photos in newspapers and magazines. The use of stills had long become incredibly expensive, with studios often charging $500 for each one printed in a book. But he made a remarkable discovery. John should have become the patron saint of film historians by revealing that the studios didn't actually own their stills. Anxious to have them printed, oops, anxious to have them printed as often and as widely as possible, 
They did not copyright them. My book had 300 photographs and I was dreading the cost, but I took John's example and stayed clear of the studios. That was 54 years ago. As Simon Crocker said, we took advice from intellectual property specialists. The studios didn't want to acknowledge it, of course, but the only letter we received in 50 years was in the mid 70s, a cease and desist order. And John replied, I've spent 10 years doing this work. I'm basically promoting your films. If you send a letter like this again, I'll sue you with an invoice for a million dollars. We never heard anything more. Had it not been for John, thousands of remarkable stills would have perished. Take a close look at the exhibition and imagine if all these photographs had been lost. Thank you so much, Kevin. We'll turn it over to John Stomberg now for Q&A. Yeah, sorry about the pause there, Kevin. I wasn't quite sure if you were done. <clears throat> that was a really, really wonderful lecture. We're, we're so pleased to have you speaking uh, on us. And before I start uh, taking questions, please feel free to put the questions in the Q&A. Um, I wanted to th thank uh, some of the people that you've mentioned. Um, in addition to thank you for presenting uh, Simon Crocker, uh, from the uh, John Cabal Foundation and Robert Dance, who was also at the um, Crocker Foundation, the, sorry, the Cabal Foundation, uh, made our acquisition of these photographs possible. And we, are, we will be eternally grateful to them both for, for the work uh, that they've made possible at the Hood uh, as we become um, sort of a center for the study of Hollywood. I just had a question that I thought I'd start with if it's okay. Um, and that's the issue of um, how do we understand the creativity of Hollywood photographers? Like how do we judge what was their contribution versus the contribution of the set designer and the, the filmmaker? That's a rough one to start with. <laughs> the, um... The creativity of the cameraman has, has obsessed me for years. And in fact, I spent the advance of the parades gone by back in 1964 on the lens that was designed and manufactured to photograph Lillian Gish by a cameraman called Henrik Sarto. And many of them, we would discover, had come up with ideas, had had lenses made to their specifications, produced a matte box, as one of them did, and I bought that as well, which has 18 different places for gauze each one having a different emotional effect. It's quite, ex I was so, so impressed with those cameramen. I could listen to them forever. Yeah, the role of gauze, for those of you <clears throat> who aren't familiar with the te technique, was a, a purely analog way of creating effects such as soft focus or uh, shading here and there in the next place. It was also a good way to make uh, somebody's um, face look a little uh, softer than it was in reality, um, hence the term a, a gauzy image. Um, the, the assistant used to burn a hole in the gauze with a cigarette so that the very center was sharp and then it, it took the rest of the face into softness, which was uh, all the rage in those days. Now, did, did John's social life include people in the field? Uh, was he part of a, a group of friends who were Hollywood photographers as well? Yes, it, it came along to those film shows on the house across the road. <laughs> and, and, That's a tremendous story, by the way. <laughs> and um, 
he he wasn't somebody who bothered a great deal about the hard facts of like that camera that with the, the end title here that's um a bell and how uh it's, they were very complicated you could put one of the a bell and how like that up against a, a modern Ariflex, and the i the image from a silent camera would be identical to the one of the modern camera given the right stock uh, there was so, so uh, few people in England anyway who had been part of the great days of Hollywood but you could find them and he was certainly somebody who spent a lot of energy tracking them down and he uh, I couldn't get over the fact that he had people staying with him Rita Hayworth was another one that I believe stayed there but he never had technicians <laughs> and he was he was interested in the romantic side of Hollywood and the hard work side, um, it was only the stills photographers that, that interested him, I think. Is it fair to say that without his interest, the whole notion of Hollywood still photography as an important contribution to visual culture generally might have been lost? I would say he was the prime mover in that, yes. The reason why I ask is because he, at the Hood now we have this collection of still photographs and we are beginning to wrestle with how best to understand them. That was my, my first question. Uh, and for the person who put the question in Q&A about the relationship between the Hood and the Getty, we don't not have one. We own the actual photographs, but you can still approach the Crocker Foundation for image reproduction um, images. Um, and that's, that's easily found online. Um, we, we, we have proudly so the, the wonderful prints, the actual prints themselves. But in photography, there's two separate bodies of intellectual property. One is the image and one is the piece of paper on which it's printed. And we have the pieces of paper on which they're printed. Um, Kevin, when, uh, Simon was uh, getting older. Did you two have a chance to go see films? And was there like a certain type of film that you two shared a love for? You know, I can't remember going to the cinema with him. <laughs> it was always discovering what he'd found and, and trying to find something that matched it that I could exchange. For in that, um, no, I don't remember, except uh, running him films like that smoldering fires evening. Yeah. Uh, that's very odd, quite right. Well, I, um, I am very grateful. If I don't see other questions, I think we can wrap up on time. Um, and so Vanessa Schwartz, I hope I answered your question. Feel free to contact us if you want contact with the Cabal Foundation. Um, are there other questions that anybody has? Uh, we're getting wonderful praise, by the way, for, for this talk uh, being our inaugural talk. And these talks are recorded and will be available later. It takes us a little while to get the digital file um, loaded up uh, and, and online. Um, there is a question of, can we add a picture of John Cabal uh, himself? for the exhibition. And I think that's a, a wonderful idea. I actually can't remember if we own like a vintage photograph of um, Cabal or whether we would have to turn to Simon for that. Um, I do have another question for you, Kevin, if it's okay. Uh, how did you become interested in silent film? I was at a very unpleasant boarding school in Sussex which was exactly like Colditz. And if I 
boy is used to escape and get rounded up and taken back to the school to be beaten. Uh, it's exactly what happened. The only good thing that the headmaster did every third weekend to tempt us away from parental visits, he showed us films and he couldn't afford talkies. So we got silent films, Harold Lloyd, um, Chaplin, of course, and I was absolutely fascinated that you could turn a room into a cinema. I thought you had to build a huge concrete block on the main, on the main road. So I begged my parents for a projector. And when I got one, went out this, to London streets looking for, for films to fit it. And I stumbled upon a pile which when I showed them to my parents, they identified Douglas Fairbanks, Bessie Love, William S. Hart. And I thought, I must find out about more about these films. <laughs> Went to a library expecting a book to fall open at a still from my film. And that's exactly what happened. There was a, also a paragraph by Iris Barry. Um, and I realized I'd got something really special. And I thought if I have a film in it that's in a book, I'm, I must get some more. And so I became an addictive collector, to, which has lasted to this day. So uh, with all that experience with silent films, is there one actor or actress that stands out as your favorite that you would watch over and over and over again? Well, it's... Um, It's the, the, the film that I admire above all other silence is Napoleon. And the actor in that is Albert Giordone, but he does a wonderful job, but he then refused to play anything except Napoleon. <laughs> and in your relationship with John Cabal, who left this world too early, uh, by all accounts. Um, do you have wishes that there was one more thing you could have done? There was, was there some unfinished business that you feel uh, that you wish you had gotten around to? Or was there a lost opportunity? I, yes, I would have very much liked to have spent several hours working through his dark green filing cabinets. <laughs> <laughs> They must have been amazing. Well, you'll have to come over and uh, see the Hood uh, collection because we are taking very good care of them. Uh, They're much loved, but um, I hope you get a chance to do just that. Um, thank you very much for um, joining us. The, you know, and one of the um, odd advantages of um, the pandemic is that we've learned how to do these things on um, on Zoom. Um, I just want to read a Simon uh, Crocker comment, um, which is talking about John screening movies onto the white wall uh, of a nearby building. The projector belonged to Rudolf Nureyev. And the funniest evening was when he showed King Kong freaking out a woman looking out of her window. <laughs> King Kong, I can just imagine that. That sounds fantastic. Uh, I really can't imagine getting away with shining a film on my neighbor's house today. Um, so he clearly was uh, probably prepared to have the conversation that ensued. Um, he played uh, Valentino, didn't he? Yeah. So um, do you have any other parting thoughts for us? Um, you don't yes. have to. Are you asking me? Mm -hmm. um, I find it very difficult to get decent blacks in video presentations. <laughs> the beautiful silent, it reminds me of uh, my filmmaking partner, Andrew Mollo. His wife was uh, just 
produced a baby and she invited me to meet the baby and she brought him to the front door and said he's much more beautiful than this really <laughs> and that's what I feel about what's happened to these gorgeous silent film stills they they, they go great they reproduced as gray flat gray the blacks are lost and uh, that drives me nuts Yeah, I'm just checking. You know, I will say the prints that we have on view uh, are uh, the first exhibition of Cabal Foundation prints since we acquired the collection are extraordinary. Uh, there is Louise Brooks print, which is just breathtaking. And Michael, our curator of American art, has put it on a wall by itself. And it's just stunning. It is absolutely stunning. So the quality of each print is really top notch. And I think that's one of the things that Cabal had an eye for was, you know, when, when it was a randomly mass produced glossy gelatin silver print um, or, um, or when it was like a beautifully handcrafted print. Um, but are you also talking about how these prints come across on Zoom? Yes, I expect a loss of quality, but... Yep. Uh, I think, you know, my theory is that the, we've lost the era in which, for instance, the first print that was made for me of Napoleon was right in all four, what, 21 reels or whatever it was at the time. Uh, and that is an incredible achievement because they were brought up in the black and white era and uh, it, they could hold it up to the light and judge the printer light impeccably. Then a generation was brought up on color and they weren't interested in black and white and they feel if they get an image, you're lucky. It's an old film like that chap said. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very sad. And this is one of the reasons why institutions that do have original prints of these great films, it's worth uh, waiting uh, for them to come around. Uh, I know uh, a lot of us make a pilgrimage out to the George Eastman house in Rochester, which has an amazing sec uh, selection of vintage film prints, which they screen on, on occasion. And it, it, it is such a different experience to see just a stunning print of those earlier films. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so. Well, uh, really, thank you very much for taking the time to join us uh, from London. Uh, Michael's in Virginia, I'm in uh, Tennessee. It's an amazing world that uh, Zoom has made possible, even though the image quality is definitely not uh, what we would like. So I invite you all to come in and see the beautiful exhibition of prints on view at the hood right now our first of what will be many uh, exhibitions drawn from this wonderful archive that John Cabal created. Um, so with that, I say thank you very much. I uh, wish you a, a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And to everybody uh, watching, thank you very much for joining us. We'll have the uh, transcript, I mean, the, uh, the, the YouTube video of this talk available in a couple of weeks. Um, and with that, we say goodbye and thank you very much.